take you to a place tonight. And if I do my job right, you won't want to go there. You will have to go there. <laughs> There's a place on earth where time stands still, and it's the home of a man who was famous, he was difficult, he was generous, he made his money, um, lost a lot of it, got an incredible mansion out of it, but he died an addict, not able to meet the bills, and was worried what would happen to his family. He deemed himself a has-been and never had the chance to become what he truly desired to be, which is a great actor. His name is Elvis Aaron Presley, and I've been to his house two times. And you can go there too, if you want to. It's called Graceland, and I can give you a little preview of that. First of all, I have to preface just a little bit for a girl growing up in Walla Walla to be transported to Memphis, Tennessee, um, was pretty strange. White people were the minority. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. People were calling me honey, and they just and this whole air about this place. You can't really describe it. It's hot, it's muggy, but just being in Memphis, you look around, you can't see anything special. It's boulevards, it's city, but you know something happened here. Some great music history happened here, and you feel like a part of it. So once you get on that bus, and that bus, you're looking around and you're wondering where Graceland could be in this busy, crazy, nothing to look at place. And then you see those famous golden gates. And once that bus crosses the threshold of those golden gates, it's just like, I don't, I don't know where all the people go. You feel like you're the only one there. You feel like you're, well, you'll get transported back to 1976 really quickly <laughs> once you get inside the house. But it really does feel like time standing still. still you look out across the lawn and the first thing you see are these beautiful horses grazing in the front yard like nobody's watching them and like they're not tourist attractions. Um, you picture Lisa Marie as a little kid, you know, driving a golf cart all over the front lawn because her dad would let her do that. And then you have to go up to the front front of the house with the big double doors. And that's where you wait to go inside. And as you look around and you think, Graceland, wow, this is supposed to be the king's house. This is how kings live. I can't wait to see what kind of showy stuff is in here. But when you really get up close to it, it looks more like a single family home on Palouse Street that you would see around here on Palouse Street. It's really natural stone color. And it looks just a little bit more modest than you would expect from the king of rock and roll. So you wait there. And you're given a set of headphones, and it's Priscilla Presley, when they tell you to start the tape, um, navigating you through this tour, which, if you know anything about them, they actually ended up really good friends, and she cared very much about him, even though they were divorced. In fact, Graceland was the way that he made a fortune for his family. He made much more money after his past for them. They're set for life, kind of. So, inside the house, the front door. To the right, you see the great room where Elvis spent all of his time with his buddies. Um, it's a cream-colored carpet, white vinyl leather. The knickknacks are just the same as they were in 1976. Nobody's touched the lamps. Y you can actually see what Elvis's taste was in lamps. It's just strange. <laughs> it's so cool. And then there's a beautiful white baby grand piano, and Priscilla's talking to you, telling you how this is where they came, to unwind, to relax. She said they would play every night, and every night Elvis would go back to gospel and do that, and that's what he enjoyed the most. To the left, you can see this big purple staircase going upstairs. You're not allowed to go up there, but you know the room is up there where he died. And then you walk through the kitchen, through the green shag carpet, and you realize wow, this stuff really is indestructible. <laughs> the, the orange shag carpet everywhere, they didn't, they didn't change anything. They just put mats down because there's millions of people going through this place all the time, but it looks amazing. It really doesn't look like anybody's touched it. So as you walk through the kitchen, you can almost smell a peanut butter and banana sandwich and picture his person, his favorite person, 
almost in the whole world, I can't remember her name, but she would take care of him and make his lunches for him and every meal and whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted. You kind of felt like Elvis was alive at that point. And I've got to say, as you walk in, you feel like this is the king. It's going to be an amazing place. You know there's going to be trophies everywhere and awards, and you're just going to see, I don't know, maybe a throne. You just don't know what to expect. But what I didn't expect and what wasn't in the house were awards everywhere. You didn't see that. You saw family pictures, Lisa Marie and the family, family room. No awards in the house that I can remember. Just a home with a kitchen and, and it was pretty humble except for that great room with the grand baby piano, baby grand. It was really comfortable, some place you'd want to just go and hang out. I was excited to get to go to the basement because I had heard that Elvis had a TV, no, a lot of TVs all the way across the wall, a TV for every channel. He really did. You go down to the basement, it's a pool room, like a pool table room, a huge bar, and a whole wall of television sets. And I think he shot at least one of them, because they were bad-mouthing him probably. <laughs> um, then you get to... Where are we going next? You do get to go outside where he had a courtyard or a racquetball court, and they did convert that to put some of some of his awards. He had enough to fill a warehouse, just floor to ceiling, or I guess an airport hangar. He had that many, but he was never happy. And you learn about this as you're walking through his house, and Lisa Marie is kind of sharing things with you, and she shared that he was never truly happy with what he did. He had no idea how big he was, for one thing. He thought he was a has-been. Everybody called him Fat Elvis. Um, what he really wanted to do was act, and he was only happy with one acting performance, and that was with King Creole. That's the only acting performance he ever liked. He, he was submissive to his colonel, his manager, and did anything that he told him to do, and unfortunately, he told him to do a lot of bad movies, which embarrassed Elvis, you know, and he was a pretty insecure person. Before he died, he actually ended up feeling like a failure. You might have heard he had to take uppers to get up because his schedule, he had to take downers after the show to fall asleep and then uppers to get up. He felt like he was a has-been. He was ter terrified by the press because he couldn't lie. He didn't know the nature of the press, so he's this nice, southern boy from the military trying to answer questions honestly and they're ripping him apart. Um, okay, pregnant pause here. I got to see the outfits all on display. Just another part where you see the, the armor of the king being chinked away just a little bit. You're seeing him more and more as a man. If you've ever been to Planet Hollywood and seen Sylvester Stallone's outfits, you know, they're like, this is this eye. It's the same with Elvis. And even the fat Elvis costumes were not anything. I mean, I'm sure they could have taken them in a little bit, but it wasn't anything like they talked about. I never saw it. I never got the fat Elvis thing. So as you end, I think it's appropriate, at, at, you get to go outside and there's Elvis's grave. The grave of his mother, Vernon Presley, his father, and Elvis's twin brother, and by the end of the tour, you realize he was just a man. I mean, all along this tour, you almost feel like he's going to be coming home any minute. And then you get to the end, and you realize he wasn't immortal. He wasn't invincible. And seeing his grave kind of put the final nail in that coffin <laughs> of thinking he was invincible. In summary, I'd like to use one of his quotes. He said, Never... <laughs> it's a really easy quote. <laughs> Never judge a man until you've walked a mile in his shoes. So what I thought was a chance to see how kings lived and how rich and powerful they are turned into a precious glimpse of the heart of a vulnerable and very breakable man. I realized he was no different than us in so many ways, and it made me respect him even more and want to go again.